or the raison d'etre of this fair, I'd like to start the, the introductions with the dealers and uh, Howard Greenberg, one of the world's foremost photography specialists, gallerists. He's an authority on 19th and 20th century photography and has been an acknowledged leader in establishing its value on the fine art market. Employing his keen eye for artistic value and a unique historical perspective, Greenberg has built a reputation for rediscovering significant photographers from the past and establishing a market for their work. He represents and exhibits photographs by many of the acknowledged masters, Stieglitz, Weston, Lartigue, Evans, and so on. Um, and he also has a fabulous collection of his own, which has been the subject of an exhibition, uh, 30,000 strong. Um, uh, in, being the subject of a traveling exhibition, which I was happy to say was at my museum, the Musée de l'Elysée, quite recently. Anthony Doffé was born in Sheffield, opened his first gallery in 1965. In 1980, he opened the largest contemporary gallery in Europe, hosting exhibitions by many of the greatest living artists, inclu including de Kooning, Bruce Nauman, Jasper Johns, Andy Warhol, <coughs> Roy Lichtenstein, Jeff Koons, Joseph Boys, Gerhard Richter, Ansel Ke Anselm Kiefer, all terrific photographers, as you know. The gallery closed in 2001 when Doffé began to work on a collection of 50 rooms, 50 rooms of contemporary art, which in 2008 he donated jointly to Tate and the National Galleries of Scotland to travel the country. And it was seen by some 5 million visitors in 25 exhibitions every year. All the shows are free and dedicated to young people and education. Inspired by Anthony's experience as a child at museums in Leicester and Edinburgh, the Artists' Rooms Touring Program aims to make the greatest contemporary art accessible to young people. There have been to date 143 of these rooms exhibited across the United Kingdom. They're managed jointly by Tate and the National Galleries of Scotland. Artists' Rooms is considered to be one of the largest and most imaginative gifts ever made to museums in the UK. Michael Wilson formed the Wilson Center for Photography in London in 1998 as an archive for research on the history, aesthetics, and preservation of photographs. It is one of the largest private collections of photography today, spanning works from, from the earliest extent photographs to the most current contemporary productions. The center is an active program of education, publication, and exhibition collaborations worldwide. Michael Wilson is a film producer, he loves small, obscure films. We won't get into that. And a leading expert on 19th century photography. He is also the UK's foremost patron of photography, having helped um, and continues to help photographers, specialists, and institutions. Quentin Bejac was appointed the Joel and Anne Ehrenkrantz Chief Curator of Photography at the Museum of Modern Art in January 2013. From 1995 to 2003, Mr. Bejac was the associate curator in the photography department at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, where he organized a number of exhibitions on 19th and early 20th century photography. He then joined the Musée National uh, Centre Pompidou in 2003, becoming chief curator in 2007. He has also published extensively on photography, most not notably the three-volume Découverte Gallimard series on the history of photography. That is our marvelous panel, and I would like to welcome them with a show of applause. Uh, <clears throat> somebody, Alison Nordstrom, described the panel as a Mount Rushmore of photography yesterday. <laughs> Um, I, I didn't intend to moderate, but the, our guests said, listen, to keep us at each other's throats, maybe you could just kind of step in when things get, uh, things get a little heated. So that, that, I see that more as my role, and I'd like to launch the conversation, because I think it'll take on a life of its own, um, with a question about this triangle we have of curator, dealer, collector. That was my idea in putting this panel together, this triangle. And I immediately thought of it as somewhat tense because each of these people has to deal with the others, but they're not, their vested interests are not always aligned. Curators are also collectors. They also have their collections to, to gather. They don't have the money. They need the private collectors. Um, the dealers sometimes are collectors, as we've seen with Howard. So it gets quite complex, and 
I imagine that uh, some of these hats get confused. So I would like to start with you, Howard, because you are also a collector. Uh, does that mean you're sort of a schizophrenic? Yes. Mike. Yes. The mic. Uh, yes, was my, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my simple answer was yes, uh, schizophrenic. Um, in, in reality, uh, for me, uh, one activity, uh, uh, being a collector, uh, did, did, did not come by design. I, I didn't set out to be a collector of photographs. Um, I love photography, as we all do, and uh, I became a dealer partially because I needed to make a living, and I like to have all, what, these wonderful photographs around me, and I became a collector as time went on more and more because I could afford to be a collector, and because I had access to so many incredible photographs, uh, that uh, touched me personally that from time to time I would, as I say, take one home. And uh, so it wasn't a, uh, a separation of power uh, in my mind. It was just an organic process that happened. And, and, and are you happy to sell them when the moment comes up? Or are you going to hold on to them for to your life? To sell from my collection, your collection, from those pictures that made it to my home. Um, well, the attempt is to keep it together always one way or another. I, I right. would hate to see them, right. you know, leave each other. They're such good friends after all these years. Um, we'll see what happens. And, and when you sell to yourself, do you take a commission? <laughs> no, but I try and pay the consigner. <laughs> Contact, could I pass the, um, pass the floor to you? So you collect for a museum with a fabulous, absolutely fabulous history and a, a kind of a, quite a closed door. You know, not, any, not anyone can just give their work to the Museum of Modern Art and then say, I'm in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, which is the, the poison in a lot of museum collections. Um, do you find it a tense relationship with the dealers? Is that something, can you be a friend, can you be friends with a dealer? I think I can, and I hope I am uh, friends with, uh, with, with some dealers. It's true that it's a... Uh, probably a slightly complex situation, but I'm not sure it's such a confused situation. It's true that uh, uh, it's true that dealers are also collectors, but I have the feeling that in a way they have always been collectors, you know, uh, from the uh, 18th or 19th century, they were already, you know, dealers, collectors. So that's not, that's definitely not specific to photography and that's definitely not uh, a situation which is a recent one. Um, and it's true that, uh, of course, uh, institutions and curators that work institutions are also in a way in the art market. We are part of that uh, of the art world, uh, not only because uh, we buy uh, from dealers or di directly from artists or estates, but also because now I'm at MoMA, so with the accession sometimes also works. So we also sell works and put them on the market, but also uh, and in a way uh, above everything because we organize shows. And I'm perfectly aware of the fact that organizing a monographic shows at MoMA on an artist, it has also a huge impact on the market, probably much more than when I was at the Pompidou. Uh, so, yeah, of course we're part of the market, but I think that uh, we can have conversation, we can agree, we can disagree, uh, we can, uh, but um, I'm not sure that uh, we'll probably have uh, an opportunity to come back to that, but I'm not sure that's such a, a new situation, that the situation is so different from what it was uh, 50 or 100 years ago. I, I'm going to put you on the spot though, Conta. I'm going to put you on the spot because I'm sure that when you walk into a gallery here, people go, it's kind of museum of modern art, Conta kind of Bejac, you know, that you, re you could make or break people. And this is true also in New York when you visit a gallery, people are thinking, oof, you know, this is, uh, Howard, am I right there? This is some power that he represents. I of course. suppose. Well, I think it is, yeah, of yeah. course. And, and in a way, that's good because that uh, recognizes the power of the institution and recognizing the power of the institution is not a bad thing, you know? It would be horrible to see uh, the rank of an artist dropping because uh, he or she has an exhibition at MoMA. So that, that, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that thanks God, does not happen. So, uh, so um, and in a way, I think that's good to recognize the power of the institution that can also have an impact in financial terms, but, but, but that has also, I think, uh, 
an impact in a more scientific way and for the history and knowledge of photography. Michael, could I ask you about your relations with dealers? I've seen you uh, around an awful lot at this fair, and you've been sitting down, talking, looking at work. You, your passion comes through. What about your relations with dealers? Uh, well, I, I think um, I might just put a different uh, slight uh, coloration on the relationship as you described it, the sort of um, uh, the tension between all of this. I, when I first started out, I wasn't collector of photography. Uh, in the 70s, I was collecting books and prints and, and things like that. And, um, but I had a friend uh, who I'd gone to college with at, uh, the, who was a curator at the Met. And uh, I got talking to him, and he kind of was in, you know, encouraging me in certain things. He showed me what the Met was doing and that. Then he introduced me to a dealer was Lucian Goldschmidt. I don't know if any of you know of him, but he was a book dealer, dealt in photography, prints, and books. Uh, he was also a scholar, and he was the kind of uh, dealer that would mentor you, a young person. And um, he would, um, uh, he'd get to know what you like. He'd show you things and that. And then when something came up that he thought you liked, he would discuss it with you. And he was very generous in his uh, time, and he was, uh, and uh, and he'd help you along. Um, when I, uh, and, and taking that, that, that sort of curator for young collector, person that's just starting out, collector, a curator, and a dealer are really wonderful uh, mentors that you can use. I also ran into Sam Wagstaff along the way and uh, got an interest in how a photographic collector of some note would uh, deal and I used to, and I'd see him over here at the auctions and we became friends and so I kind of had a all these people that I could uh, uh, get to know get to know their views and see how uh, you know understand what we were talking about which was mostly 19th century and of course what they call classic now um, I was going to say about the situation uh, because I was the idea, can you can a curator make or break a, a young artist? Uh, possibly, but I find more a curator uh, has the luxury of waiting. They can sort of wait, let dealer, let dealers and collectors build up the people, and then when it's ready, they the the work has been t uh, you know has stood the test of time. Then a curator can come in and then do a show, and that really does take the person off. But I, I think that's, a curator uh, has the ability to uh, be a guide but, uh, to artists, but also he has the ability to stand back and wait, because it's, he's in for the really long game. Uh, so I was on a panel once, and somebody described me as an end user when we run around like this. And, and, uh, and I thought, well, the ultimate end user is the museum, because it never, it supposedly, ever goes away. Um, Anthony, you, 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 oh, Howard, just before, Anthony, you come from another sphere. Does the, um, start perhaps asking if, if the photography world seems exotic to you? We were speaking about uh, Lucien Goldschmidt uh, a moment ago. I remember as a very young dealer, um, first of all in rare books and then in drawings, that Lucien Goldschmidt was a wonderful person to know and you felt that he was interested in young people. He wanted to help you. He wanted to be generous. It was a, um, a marvelous thing to know him in New York in the 60s, early 70s, like that. He, he was legendary by the time I could... Into the mic, Howard, please. I say he was legendary by, by the time I came on the scene. Well, I was deeply grateful to him, I must say. And um, after 21 years dealing in contemporary art and not, I regret to say, in including photography, really. We showed Runica Dijkstra once or twice. Um, to go into another world where I was now a collector... Um, it was very, very important to me, uh, my relationships with photography dealers. 
and my relationship with your gallery, Howard, has been crucial to me, and my friendship with your staff. I feel like we're old friends, and um, working with Jeffrey Frankel uh, in San Francisco has been a fantastic experience. We put together, I think, according to Dune Arbus, the best collection of Diane Arbus in the world, and that none of that could have happened without a real trust in Jeffrey, his caring very much that that collection was as complete as possible, his generosity. Those were enormously important things to me in the last 10 years. Howard, yes, please. I, I think uh, what Anthony's uh, talking about and something Michael said as well uh, reminds me of the, uh, I think it's perhaps obvious, but a very important aspect of this triangular relationship, which is collaboration, which is sharing of information, which is um, uh, uh, planning and working together for the greater good. And, and that might sound uh, flowery and naive, but I, I think, uh, best case scenario, we all talk to each other and we share ideas on the projects we're doing. And, um, uh, we may have our own agendas, but they, there are lots and lots of moments when they coincide and we work well together. I think, uh, I actually am curious what Anthony has to say uh, about uh, that same sort of collegial activity going on in the contemporary art world. Because the I know it does the contemporary art world, world is brutal. It's brutal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously brutal. Um, uh, when I see Karen in your gallery, I normally see her in your office. When you come into your office, mm -hmm. you don't hide any papers. There's nothing <laughs> that seems to be secret. Um, it's a different atmosphere. You couldn't do that in the contemporary art world. People would not want you to see what they've written down on the telephone pad, <laughs> the letters. Your, your, your world is totally open and friendly and truthful. The contemporary art world is, by comparison, brutal. Mm. Howard, could we st st stay with you for a minute and just talk about uh, dealers have to be terrifically, <laughs> terrifically competitive. Dealers have to be. Mm. And uh, I always enjoy the art fairs because they know I have no money, so they're always happy to <laughs> chat with me until somebody with money comes in, and then they're off like a shot. <laughs> but um, you have to collaborate, but you can't collaborate. You can't divulge. If you have a bad year, you can't tell the other dealers that, right? So you have to, but you also need information from the other dealers. Um, and I'll, I'll give you, just, be, just to complete that, I love um, the gallery, Robert Morad upstairs. This isn't really a promotion, but it, I guess it is. Robert Morad is a really smart guy, and he, with a grin, he tells me he always positions himself when he goes to art fairs between two local, art, local galleries. So he gets all, you know, the two London galleries, so he gets all that traffic going through his. So you, all, you guys have to be very smart, and, but he said, don't tell anybody that. So I'm, <laughs> and I have to respect that. So, yeah. <laughs> if I said we're not very smart, would you keep that under wraps also? <laughs> Please? No, I, I, again, of course, uh, there's competition. Uh, there's always been competition where we, you know, every, every dealer wants this great photograph or to represent that great artist. I mean, uh, but I must say, you know, I'm doing this more than 30 years now. Uh, there have been very, very few instances where that uh, competitive spirit has become onerous, you know, has really gotten in the way of, of enjoying the work. Is this <laughs> because doing. you get more, you, you get more collaborating with the other gallerists? Uh, sometimes, yeah. yeah. I mean, we do tend to collaborate quite a bit. I, I like to work with many other galleries. I, I represent, uh, as you know, artists in the States, and I feel if I don't collaborate well with galleries around the world, I'm not doing a service to those I'm representing because it's the most practical way for me to get the work seen widely. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of cl collaboration in that way. Um, this competition for material, for, especially in the vintage world, there's not so much great stuff around anymore. So you know, uh, there may be competition um, uh, for this representation of a private collection that's coming back on the market and things like that. But you know, we're all used to it. And, and I've always said in photography, one of the pleasures is there's enough to go around. 
you know, so, so your life doesn't depend on it. I will say this, though. The, the real competition, the real problems is not with the dealers and each other. It's the auction galleries. You know, that's who we're really competing with more than each other. Okay. For material. Two, just two for words on that. Two words more on that. Com competition with the auction house. Mm -hmm. You just explain why that's a moment. That moment has happened now. Well, uh, the auctions, uh, photography auctions, have proliferated. I'm sure you're all aware of the scores of auctions all around the world. There's a lot of photographs in the world. Um, th in a certain way, uh, selling in auction and buying in auction is more attractive. There's this objective. Uh, entity called the auction that, that's only a medium for uh, photographs and money to pass through. So it would appear to be a more <clears throat> straightforward and honest situation engaging the market in uh, getting a proper amount of money for something if you're selling it. Uh, but it's not as simple as that. And uh, the auctions put it out that way. And then um, since their business is based on selling, they get their commission no matter what something sells for. Uh, it's not a problem for the auctions to uh, uh, move uh, photographs, in this case, through the auctions at prices uh, that really undermine the market, undermine all, mm -hmm. all the work that we've been doing for years. And uh, you can't blame them. It's a free market economy, and they do what they do. But uh, there's very little sympathy and collaboration between uh, deals and auctions about things right. like that. Now, um, in the contemporary art world, Anthony will say this, it's even worse. There's... Uh, very much collaboration and manipulation between the auction houses right. and the dealers, and that's probably true. Mm -hmm. But in photography, it's just hurt the market. All right. Michael? Uh, yeah, I could uh, speak a bit about that. Um, and I, and it, uh, I'll just cover a few of those areas. Um, one is if you uh, go back to when we first started here with photography and the auctions in London, the seller paid 10 percent, and that was it. It was a wholesale market. Um, uh, basically, all the dealers to my house that uh, after the last auction on the auction week, we'd have a big cocktail party. Everyone would be trading photographs around. Uh, we'd be uh, dividing up albums. Uh, it was a very co uh, collegial type of atmosphere. And everybody, uh, I've, I always found the dealers to be really good. And they were good about exchanging information. They, they were, you know, it's a, it was an area that didn't have a lot of art history or scholarship in it. So it needed dealers, and dealers turns out turned out to be the best scholars. I was amazed, you know, it, it's, to this day I'm amazed at when I uh, how much they know more than say uh, curators and university people about the things they deal in because dealers actually have to put the money on the table. It's quite different from the scholars and the curators who you know, they put their money on the table eventually, but uh, it's. Uh, when, when you have to take the risk, you make sure you do this study. So, so they ha they're a great asset, and a good dealer is a great guide. What's happened is that the, the auction houses decided to become retail houses and compete with the... Uh, and they started raising their uh, prices and getting better and better material and advertising instead of being wholesalers as retailers. Now that has put a lot of pressure on dealers. Uh, and uh, I have spoken to a lot of dealers who are saying it's getting harder and harder to run a gallery, to have exhibitions. We have to go to all these fairs on top of that. A lot of them are becoming, just closing their galleries and going in. And it's, a, it's really undermining the entire business because what do you get an auction house? I talked to a guy the other day. He says, oh well, at least they stand behind their work and you know it's authentic. I said, yeah, they stand behind their work, but so will every dealer. But the fact is, you don't get any uh, real insight. And if and they're not telling you if it's a good print, especially if it's vintage or something. They don't give you a, any confidence about what they're. They're just a, a selling place. And unfortunately, there's some dealers that are that too. They're just salesmen. They're not, as I think of it, as a dealer. I think a dealer is a scholar and a confident, is very, you know, it leads and, and is a mentor to collectors. And then when the collector gets to a certain point, there's, a, there's an exchange of information, understanding this is, uh, you know, we sort of all on this journey to find, a, you know, to develop this field. And I am so disappointed with what, where the, uh, the direction it's going, because I think, I don't see any young dealers coming up in vintage and 19th 
uh, 19th century and, and the vintage. Very few young dealers, very few fresh blood. A lot of the people I know are my age and they're starting to retire. And uh, I don't, it makes me worry about uh, the future. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's a real problem and I don't see the answer to it. Quentin, could you, could you reflect a little on that? And I was about to ask you another question, but what Michael said is so interesting. How do you relate to that? And the question would be, could you tell us very briefly how MoMA acquires work? How MoMA acquires work? Well, MoMA acquires work as most uh, US institutions do, in fact, through committees. We have uh, three committees a year with uh, a number of people that sit, that sit around the table, uh, that pay their dues to sit around that table and to have discussions and to vote uh, the, the acquisitions that are proposed to them by, uh, by the curators from the department. So it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, simple and quite efficient uh, system. Uh, and of course, it's a system, you know, I, I come from the French system, so I know the pros and cons of each system, going from a completely public funded system to a completely private one because MoMA is a completely private institution. Uh, and I see also that uh, the French system is slowly dying because uh, French institutions receive less and less money from the state, especially for the acquisition. So they have more and more to rely on private support. So they're, I would say, in a transition phase that will take years and years. Uh, whereas it seems that, uh, that uh, the American system is working, but it's working, you know, uh, with also some crises <laughs> uh, that are much more brutal, but that are usually uh, healed much uh, quicker also. So uh, these are two very different systems, but I had the feeling when I left the Pompidou that that was not possible anymore to have a real acquisition program uh, with uh, the system that was, that, that was in place, which I think I am able to do uh, at, uh, at, uh, at MoMA. Uh, but once again, it can change very rapidly. I was not here in 2008, 2009, but I know from my colleagues, curators, that suddenly uh, the uh, flow of money was, uh, was dried and yeah, that uh, for two, three, four years, the system was working less well than, than, than it is working now. So these are two completely different systems, but I have the feeling that today, yet, the private American system is working slightly better than the uh, public-funded old French system. And if we zero in to you as a person with a passion, let's say you have a passion for a photographer who isn't so well known, and you go to that committee meeting, you have to be pretty well informed with your arguments, I, I it's suppose. It's true, it's true, it's true. That's probably one of the, I would say, one of the drawbacks of the system. It's, that's, it's a, what I would call a self-perpetuating system, you know? you have collectors around the table that collect certain things, yeah. that are aware and that are interested in certain things, then you have to be very pedagogical about what you want to do as soon as you want to go in other directions. Uh, and uh, that's also part of your role, you know, to, to be pedagogical, to know uh, what they like, but also sometimes to try to convince them to go in another direction that is in a way to seduce them, you know. Uh, etymologically speaking, seducere is leading someone, someone in another direction. So it's a lot about, you know, seduction and trying to make them aware that there are other things, that, that things that are interesting, that they're not personally interested in, that they don't have in their collection, that they do not collect, and yet that they need to uh, support the museum to acquire and to go in another direction that they would not have taken themselves. So it's, 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 it's true, it's a lot of uh, diplomacy, uh, it's a lot of pedagogy, but that's, uh, yeah. yeah. And Anthony, could, uh, um, of course, Contes, even if it's a private, it's still a public institution in that, in that sense, uh, in, the, in the social sense. Would you treat a curator who walks through the door, um, who's a, uh, sorry, a private collector who walks through the door, or a curator from the Tate, or another museum, would you tend to treat them differently, or do we have a slightly different strategy on how to move work? I think that, <clears throat> I think we all have to admire very much the American system. The American system really targets collectors for long-term relationships. I remember for 
20 years, once a month, being in New York, and I would have lunch once a month with Bill Lieberman, who was chairman of 20th Century Art at the Metropolitan Museum. We always had a one-to-one -one lunch, and we, I would tell him everything that was happening in London and what I knew what was happening in Europe, and he would tell me everything that he should be telling me and some other things about what was happening in New York and in America. The relationship was one-to-one, -one, but often when I got to the table, there was somebody else, usually a very glamorous lady who was a widow <laughs> with a lot of jewelry, a lot of style, and who adored Bill as her walker. And maybe he would, Christmas time, he'd go on her yacht. What were they talking about? He was giving her attention A sort of, he used to say to everybody, call me Uncle Bill. He was giving his Uncle Bill to her. And when she talked about what am I to do, what should I do, what do I do, you know, I'm now 81, Bill. I want to be very clear to do the right thing. Bill made sure she did the right thing. And what was the right thing? It was a marriage forever in heaven with the Metropolitan Museum. <laughs> and that was the Gelman collection and the Matisse collection and many, many more. I admired so much the way he behaved and thought that is the right way to behave with collectors. The powerful, her powerful husband had gone to a far, far better place seven or eight or 10 or 12 years ago. And here was this widow with this fantastic collection and he would look after her. And it was distinguished when he took her to the opera that he was Bill Lieberman and she was whoever she was. And it was very fascinating for me catching part of that conversation which I could interpret and to see with her the way that she loved Bill and the way that Bill looked after her. I thought, this is America. We do not have that, really, in the same way in Europe. We do not have that in the same way in the United Kingdom. And we really focused as a gallery on selling to museums in the last year that uh, um, we were uh, functioning. I think it was 55% of our inventory went to museums around the world. When I say it went to museums around the world, what I mean is that it went either directly to the museums and was very often funded by particular collected, collectors, or it went to the collector with an agreement that this was going to the museum. In San Francisco, for example, there was a whole group of collectors, all of whom knew each other, all of whom liked each other, and they collected sort of as a pack, if you can imagine such a thing. They didn't duplicate uh, their collections so that everything made sense. I'm sure that some of the people in this room were in San Francisco in the last month, two months, seeing the fruits of that collecting. That relationship with a museum of collectors seems to me the right way for museums to behave, the right way to find finance, and the right way to keep the community happy 
working, going forward, doing something really meaningful. Conta, in that description, is, is something lost in the American system? Do you have a, a little more freedom, perhaps? Less money, but more freedom in the, in the, in the French system or the European system? No, I wouldn't say so. No. no, no, I don't have the feeling that I lost any freedom. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. I think that, uh, you know, you, you, have, you have different bureaucratic systems, you know. <laughs> there's a French bureaucracy, but I also realize that there's an American bureaucracy. But having said this, you know, I, I don't feel that I have less freedom uh, in the U.S. than I, have, than I had. In fact, I have more freedom because in, you know, I'm in charge of the acquisition program. Uh, and in, even if, of course, I have to inform my director and he has uh, a voice and uh, he, he gives me advice, you know, I'm, I'm in charge, which was not the case at the Pompidou when I had a director who was also, who had a strong voice and who was in the end deciding uh, which were the acquisition proposal that we were to, to, to do. So no, I have more freedom. <laughs> Um, we have 10 minutes maximum, so um, our panel actually asked, let's get some questions from the audience. Alison. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. The, the one, I, I really like what Michael said about how the best dealers are scholars, and certainly the best collectors are scholars. I would like to just change the way we think about time a little bit. And the really important thing about museums is that they're keeping the stuff. They're taking care of it. And when I was a museum curator, I spent a tremendous amount of time helping dealers authenticate signatures. Um, the best dealers would come and spend time looking at what we had. And the idea of the museum collection as um, an educational resource for everyone who's involved in photographs is really important. And this conversation has been fascinating, but very much um, based in the present, very much about we're acquiring things now. And I think we need to think of museums as places that made some of their best acquisitions 100 years ago. And um, that, in, in many cases, provides a, an intellectual and material basis for the work that collectors do and curators do and, and um, dealers do. And I just wanted to throw that into the conversation because, you know, museums collect in perpetuity. Collectors don't, dealers don't. And that's a really important distinction I just wanted to throw out. Howard? Well, I, I think that that goes on all the time. I mean, I, I know the... Um, the, the um, committees uh, uh, that Cotton has referred to are composed, uh, com composed mostly of people who want to learn more. That's why they're there. They trade uh, money support for the ability to learn more about photography and have a say. And then, of course, um, as you say, most dealers will go to museums, various museums, to learn. Um, uh, whether it's looking at the exhibitions, I mean, that's the easy way, or going into the collections to research something that's relevant. Um, <clears throat> that kind of collaboration goes on all the time, and I think it's wonderful, and it should, you know, should be that way. Uh, another question? Mario? Um, I want to make a remark about a couple of things that have been said, and this is that I'm not against, um, like, the system that you have been describing. For example, a group of collectors sitting around the table and deciding what the museum should acquire, or a widow donating uh, her collection to a museum or contributing to the creation of a collection in a museum. Or, but I think uh, we should also be well aware that uh, mm, the direction we are going to is that the business or the private uh, finances are determining the course or what is visible and important in the art world these days. And I, as I said before, I'm not against that, but at the same time we should also consider the fact that public institutions that don't have any connection with private collections 
or private finances should play an important role because each country has to have a, an artistic voice, an artistic manifesto in, as a basic part of its identity. And that's identity that is conveyed through art on, can only come from public institutions that, as I said before, have no connection with fairs, galleries, dealers, collectors. Otherwise, it will become just a big uh, business and the role of culture with capital C and of each country showing his culture through <laughs> art, which is what we all know in art history and like, will be lost. Mario, can I quickly comment? There's a whole thing we haven't discussed here. That's the rise of the festival. In photography, these festivals are spreading like mushrooms, and younger photographers are completely ignoring the gallery system, the museum system. And it's working very, very well. And they trade favors. As it, this network is growing all the time. So it's not necessarily that we have the whole picture um, with our Mount Rushmore panel today. Um, I, I, just, I could yes, just say, Michael. just on, if you go back through our history, uh, there's plenty of uh, examples where that doesn't happen. I, uh, curators are not necessarily the best people to judge what's good. Uh, artists depend on everybody, they depend on dealers, curators, and collectors. And sometimes uh, the collectors are the only ones that believe in them or respond, or, and they'll keep the work. And eventually, it'll come around and be, uh, get into the museums. It's the, the idea that somehow, uh, uh, that any one group of these people know what good art is, is really uh, uh, just uh, not possible. I mean, in, if you look at the history of art, you'll find that there are a lot of people rejected, rejected by everybody, that, and, and yet somebody managed to hold their work to the point where it became, uh, 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 it was recognized as important. I just mentioned that, that there's no single, of, and it doesn't mean the, the government has a great, they can do something, fine, but I find that's a limited thing. When, uh, you know, I, I work in the Art Fund. We're an independent organization. We do things that the government won't do, uh, uh, collections and that, in this country. And uh, certainly it needs all of these things because it's a, it's a crapshoot. And you never know, the hist only history tells what's good and bad. But everybody, it has to be kept, it has to be collected, and it has to be preserved. On that magnificent note, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to terminate. The, the panel is quite happy to meet in the courtyard with any of you for specific questions, but we have to transit quickly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>